Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We'll just give it a few seconds to let some people roll in and then we'll get started. Great. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Predictive Maintenance as a Service. How can this concept support the digital transformation of your plant? My name is Becky Christmas. I'm a project director at Reuters Events, and I focus on the downstream events and content. Just some, some information before we start then. This webinar will last approximately one hour and is being recorded. So we will send you the full audio recording within 24 hours in case you'd like to listen again. There will be a 15 minute audience Q&A at the end. So please use the, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout the webinar, and we will answer those questions at the designated time. The webinar today will be led by Pregognize, a predictive maintenance company addressing the process industry. It is part of Samsung Group, headquartered in Frankfurt, Germany, specializing in control valve engineering. The speakers for the webinar today are Robert Newhouse, who is a global business lead of Samsung Samgard Technology, who is driven to make new technologies work in real life operations. And Afina Rajakumar, who is the process engineer in Samsung AG, who is an expert in process analytics and process simulation. Great, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Robert. Well, thank you, Bec uh, Becky, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody in, uh, in the webinar. As uh, stated, uh, I'm Robert Nijhuis, and I'm responsible, uh, globally responsible within Samsung for the predictive maintenance uh, software. And today I want to share with you our findings in our, the solution predictive maintenance as, uh, as a service. And to do that, uh, I've made a small guide for you to uh, to show out uh, the logic of uh, the presentation. Uh, first, I want uh, to share with you how we, uh, why actually uh, companies are uh, using predictive uh, maintenance. And then we take a step on uh, how it works and what considerations there are in using predictive maintenance. And then we dig into, uh, a bit deeper into the fact uh, why uh, companies use it as a service. After that, my colleague uh, Divina will take over and uh, she will share some experiences uh, and findings uh, of her uh, in PDM as a service in practice. And after that, we have the Q&A and uh, you're able to, uh, to ask your questions or we answer the questions you already asked uh, during the webinar, of course. Um, along the webinar, we also have some polls. So uh, please uh, be prepared for some questions uh, during the webinar. And I'm very curious to your answers. So let's get started. And please allow me to have a first short introduction about uh, Samsung, uh, the company. It acquired Recognize uh, uh, about three and a half years ago. And Samsung is a supplier of equipment uh, towards the process industry for over 110 years, uh, with a revenue of about $700 million and about four and a half thousand employees worldwide. We can say that Samsung is a truly global company. And during the last years, Samsung has also uh, developed digital solutions in their portfolio. And uh, the focus there is on predictive maintenance solutions that could be either based on diagnostic data uh, to uh, inform our clients on the status of, for example, the control valves. But we also have uh, uh, an, uh, a solution in place, we call it SEMGuard, which is uh, based on uh, process data, providing early alerts on upcoming failures in a whole plant. And we do it for the process plant. So we are uh, applying this SEMGuard software in the chemicals industry, petrochemicals, the pulp and paper, and cement industry, et cetera. So quite broad. So why predictive maintenance? Actually, what you want to do with predictive maintenance is you want to have an early detection of upcoming failures. What you see here is typically a failure curve uh, in general. So what you see is that the failure starts, of course, uh, uh, very small. And actually, what we know is that failures are represented by small changes uh, in, for example, temperature on the operating envelope, etc. 
but when the failures continue and start to grow, uh, that's the moment when you can hear it, smell it, and see it. But of course, what you want to do is you want to be at your failure as soon as possible. And that has some reasons. And eh? if the failure is still small, or you can uh, uh, correct it without uh, any expensive uh, repairs or part replacements, and that's profitable. So the earlier you de detect the failure, and the lower the cost related to the failure are. So that's actually the key of uh, predictive maintenance. And uh, the software, uh, predictive maintenance software, is focusing focusing on these small changes in uh, data that you can see after a failure starts. So the software works there to detect these upcoming failures in a very early stage. So why do uh, companies apply uh, predictive maintenance? Uh, actually, for, for, for more reasons, but the three main are, uh, uh, you can, of course, lower your maintenance cost. Uh, if you're aware of upcoming failure and uh, before it's too big or too complex, uh, you need less time of your uh, uh, maintenance people and you have less uh, uh, equipment to replace. So that's, uh, of course, a positive thing. Next to that, and I think that's even more important, then you have to value additional production. So this means that um, because you can detect the failure in the early stage, and you can uh, diminish the effect on uh, product quality, for example, or you can improve the plant uptime. And finally, uh, uh, use, the use of predictive maintenance improves your safety. You have more time, you have smaller uh, failures, you have your people less outside in the plant, and that's what you want. So it improves safety also. So actually, those are the main three reasons for companies to use predictive maintenance. To understand how it works and what considerations there are, uh, please, uh, 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 I'd like to share with you uh, different maintenance strategies. So what you see uh, on the left is the reactive maintenance. And what you see uh, is, um, that actually there's no data needed in reactive maintenance. It, it's, it's a run to failure strategy. And so you don't need any data in your, um, in your decisions. You, you just wait until it fails and then you replace it. And what you see on uh, the right side is the two actually AI and machine learning based strategies. So the, the new upcoming strategies. I see the pre uh, predictive maintenance and the prescriptive maintenance. And what you see on the lower side, on the right side, is the amount of data that's used. And what you see in predictive maintenance, hey, you have a fair amount of data used. But in prescriptive maintenance, for example, you see a lot of data. So what you see in prescriptive maintenance is that uh, you place sensors on, uh, on your assets. Hey, you try to gain all kinds of information to have this uh, situation clear, and uh, which shows you what to do uh, if there's a failure upcoming. And that's important to understand because it also mirrors in the strategy we see uh, in process uh, plans. If you look at the typical process plan, then you see here uh, an overview of the assets that actually are in uh, a process plan. So you see the control valves, you see the heat exchangers, reactors, uh, the compressors, turbines, etc. And you have the more critical equipment, like the rotating critical equipment, the more expensive equipment. And what we see is that most of the time, these equipments are very well overlooked. So you already gather this data. Uh, you put your sensors in place. You know what's happening there because you don't want them to fail during the operations. And actually, we don't see it a lot failing during operations. But what we also see is that the more regular equipment is actually less overlooked. So there's, there's, there's less, less uh, guidance of predictive maintenance on the other equipment. And that's um, by knowing that the fact that uh, around 70% or more of the failures uh, is grounded in this uh, regular equipment, and you, uh, um, you would miss out a large stuff. So, and actually that's where, for example, uh, the SEMGuard software comes in. Uh, SEMGuard software is predictive maintenance software, so it, it's able to detect these upcoming failures over the whole plant, over all assets. And um, 
please let me uh, let's let's take a small deep dive um, in machine learning to understand how this works. So what you actually see here, there are two main strategies in machine learning. You have like three or four, but the two main strategies are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And um, the supervised learning is where uh, people train the machine. So what you see is you work from known scenarios, known uh, failures, and you learn the machine to recognize these failures and uh, uh, they'll tell you what to do. And most of the time it's repeating issues. So for to be statistically relevant, they need a, a failure to be uh, repetitive for 10, 20, 25 uh, times, for example. And next to that, I'm oh, sorry, for the supervised, uh, we, what you see is that it's mostly applied on individual assets. Next to that, you have the unsupervised machine learning. It's actually uh, learning from the system without human guidance. So it does not need scenarios. The unsupervised machine learning learns from the system and the data it provides. So it does not need scenarios and it can cover both. And because it does not need the scenarios, it can cover the knowns and the unknowns. So the, the, the failures you know, but also the failures you don't know, the upcoming failures, and that's very important. Looking at the process plan, and we know, we've seen that problems can occur everywhere. It's not in, in specific assets that you know, uh, they're typically, they can occur everywhere in the plan. And what we also see is that most of the time, they're not identical historical problems. And next to that, every plant behaves differently. So what we see is that, uh, for example, a plant A, and near, uh, near the seashore uh, behaves totally different than plan B uh, uh, inside uh, 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 a country. So what you learn from plan A does not necessarily apply on plan B. This means that for process plans, it's very hard, and it's perhaps even impossible to uh, train uh, machine learning for the whole plant. So the supervised machine learning is not applicable on the whole plant. And that's why we use unsupervised machine learning. So unsupervised machine learning is for the whole plant instead of assets. And please, uh, Becky, I want to have the first uh, poll question. My question to you is, uh, do you use any type of predictive maintenance toolings or services in your plant? And we have uh, four answers uh, ready for you. Could you share them uh, with the public? Thank you. So I give you 20 seconds to, uh, to answer the, the question. I still see some uh, answers uh, coming in, so I'll wait for another few seconds. Okay, thank you. Yeah, what you actually see is uh, that um, uh, covering the entire plant by predictive maintenance, it, it, it's not very uh, common yet. Uh, although we know that uh, uh, plant failures can occur uh, everywhere, we mainly focus on the critical assets or don't have it in place at all. So, um, and that, that raises the question. Okay, you can, um, well, I'll click it away, no problem. Okay. So how do, how, do you, how do you get to this? Um, my computer is stuck now. Please one moment. I cannot go through the slides. That's a pity. One moment. Robert, if you stop sharing your screen and then share it again, it might work. Okay. We'll try that. Let's see if we have the magic bullet here. Yeah, there it is. There we go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So how, how do you do it? How can you cover a whole plant without these extra investments in, 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 
in sensors and in 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 in, in tooling, etc. So what you do, what we see is that there's a lot of data. You know, there in the pro process industry, there's a lot of data already stored in your story. You, know, you measure temperature, flow, pressure, quality, viscosity, vibrations, whatever, and you all store it in uh, your historian, uh, historian data. So you have like thousand, ten thousand of tags that are all stored here. And what we've seen actually in the beginning in this failure curve is that the equipment problems are often reflected in slight changes of the data. So we know that we have to look for the slight changes. So what, what you could do, but it was impossible actually, yeah, you would, could have an operator or a process engineer or an engineer looking at all this data continuously to see if there are any deviations. But knowing that you have like 1,000, 10,000 tags to follow, that's impossible. It's beyond human capability, so to say. And even the, the data is not presented in a proper way. And so it, it's very hard to keep a continuous eye on, uh, on all the data. And what you do sometimes is if you have an incident, you try to look back and see if the data tells you something on the incident and so you can learn. But it's impossible to, 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 to check it continuously 24 seven and with uh, uh, the actual plant data. And actually, that's where the AI comes in place. And the AI is able to see, to find these deviations and these anomalies in your data and register them and uh, uh, give an alert when it's possible. And please let me uh, share with you how that works. So what you actually do, and we saw the, the supervised uh, uh, machine learning was focused on the failures and the recognition of the failures. And uh, uh, the unsupervised, uh, the, sum, uh, the sum guard software, for example, it, fa uh, it focuses on uh, the normal plant behavior. So how does it work? You have this historical data in your uh, uh, historian. Uh, we say in general about 13 months. And what we do is we put this data in this unsupervised machine learning process. So the the, 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 the machine learning, the algorithms start to work. And what they do is to create what we call a normality cluster. And actually, it's a representation of the normal behavior of a plant. And this is what you could see as a normal, normality cluster. And what you see here is that, for example, the tech one value is in this range, and the tech two value is in this range, and the tech three value is in this range. That, that's the normal behavior. And the, and the, the algorithms are able to determine based on the typicals of the plant and your process and have to determine uh, 10, 50, 20, 40 normality clusters. And these normality clusters, they are stored in what we call a baseline machine learning model. And if, if you know what's normal, what's normal plant behavior, you also know what's abnormal plant behavior because uh, if you have a situation that's not in the normality cluster, it's abnormal. So you have an anomaly, and that's where you can say, okay, that's interesting because it behaves differently. Could it be an upcoming failure? So what you do here is find these anomalies, but it's not enough. Because if you would only do it this way, you will probably end up with hundreds, over hundreds of uh, uh, alerts every day. And that's not that's not what you want. You need to uh, filter out these uh, uh, the relevant alerts from the in irrelevant alerts. And we do it in, in the following way. So what you could do is hey, uh, by combining uh, the knowledge that's also already in the PND and the knowledge that it's in the heads of the, the operators, hey, it will take a workshop of one day to, to combine it. And what you can do or what we can do is uh, we have special software tools that make um, yeah, a, a digital twin. In this case, we call it a, a causality model. So it understands the causalities, the interactions of the different tags in your plant. And that's very important because if you understand these interactions and you can filter out the relevant from the not relevant alerts. So the causality model acts in that sense as a filter on all these data. Well, looking at practice, and we have the, the baseline model, and that's 
the normal behavior or that understands the normal behavior of, of the plant with the normality clusters and it's compared with the actual plant data. And if there's an anomaly, it's filtered by the causality model. And uh, if it's a relevant alert, that's the way uh, we, uh, we, we, we uh, generate just a limited number of relevant early alerts. And when you say a limited number of rel relevant early alerts, uh, in practice, it would be uh, depending on the complexity of, uh, of the plant and the operations and stability, uh, one, two, three, four, five relevant early alerts. So this is sort of software can do yeah? it. Uh, it can show you uh, 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 the section and the part type. So what you see here is uh, and uh, the technology works. It provides you with uh, uh, the place and uh, the time where uh, the upcoming uh, failure is. So and what, what keeps us from taking action? But we all know that it's not that simple. This is the technology that provides something. But when we talk about predictive maintenance, it's not only the technology. It's also how we act on technology. So uh, why is it so complex? And then let's take a deeper dive. Why is it so complex if you get your alerts presented and you know what to do and to bring it into practice? And that has to do with uh, what we call the maintenance cycle. So uh, looking at that, uh, you have two major uh, motions and uh, maintenance motions. Of course, you have your turnarounds every uh, five years. Uh, most of the time, the process in the field, you work from five to five years in your turnarounds doing your maintenance and all, all, all stuff. So uh, it's very well planned. You start two years in advance and uh, you plan, you plan your subcontractors, you gather your data. So you have all the information ready, ready to make a proper decision on uh, the turnaround. And next to that, you have uh, the daily, the failures in your daily operations. And they have actually, uh, most of the time, quite different dynamics. Yeah? So it's like, okay, there's a failure upcoming. Uh, it's it's more reactive, eh? so we see something, we hear something, and then uh, we need to fix it uh, right away uh, to keep the process running. And it's also what you see, for example, in 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 in, in where uh, the exit is uh, in uh, in the assets at the expensive rotating equipment. It it may not fail. It's not allowed to fail. So the turnarounds, you're fully equipped there, and you make it work. And it's some part also for the regular equipment. But in this daily failures, actually, that is where the immediate savings of predictive maintenance are. So if you could prevent these failures from happening in your daily operations, and you would gather immediate savings from your predictive maintenance. But it's complex because it's a reactive environment most of the time. And who's responsible for the prevention of failures? Actually, what, what we see, what we experience is that um, uh, uh, people get used to, okay, you, let me put it a different way. Uh, to make a to action just by a data that's provided by uh, uh, software is very uncommon to the cars. Normally you say, okay, we see that the, the, uh, uh, the, the pump is about to fail because we hear it, we see all kinds of vibrations, okay, let's fix it. But now you have to make a decision based on uh, trends and data from uh, from software. That's totally different kind of way of working. And it's also uh, that you, we don't see that people are really responsible for preventing these failures in this reactive environment. And that brings us to uh, my second poll question. Uh, given this context yeah, where you can see uh, and that most of the time it's reactive to actual problems instead of reacting to the software showing there's a, there will be a problem. How prepared are you in your team to use predictive maintenance in such an, uh, in such an environment? I see the answers already coming in. Becky, the, the, the viewers can also see the answers, eh? Yes, they can. Okay, perfect.
I'll wait for five more seconds. Okay, thank you for answering. So what you see here is that uh, most of you think uh, you're not ready or making the first step to be ready. And um, actually, that's what we see also in practice. So there's, there's nothing strange about this. Could you click the poll away or should I do it, uh, Becky? Yeah, that's fine. I've stopped sharing the results. So if you just want to click off, then that's fine. Okay. Well, let's hope that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's stuck again, but we know what to do. Uh, share screen. Sorry for this. It's the webinar inconvenience. So it should work now. Oh, it's annoying. Yes. There it is. Okay, so um, what do we see? So what do we see when we come to the customers and uh, and they've decided to to put this predictive maintenance software in place? Uh, what do we experience? And that's also where we think the value of uh, predictive maintenance as a service is. What we see is hey, you can present uh, the place and the, the item where um, uh, the, the failures are coming, but it's not enough. You need to guide it. You need to guide this process, uh, especially in the beginning, in plans to have it working properly. What you see is the barriers we experience is this, uh, what I already explained is reacting to upcoming events. It's a totally new perspective. Right? Uh, uh, actually, what, what people say, what we notice is that uh, it, it's not considered a problem. So when you see the software uh, raising its hand and saying there's something wrong, it's not considered a problem yet. It's considered uh, a problem when uh, it, 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 it's broken or uh, and there are heavy vibrations, but not when the software, software notices. So you need to guide this. And what we also see is that uh, the time pressure uh, is one of the barriers. And that's simply what we're talking about is simply here is uh, the fact that they don't have the time to take a look at uh, all these uh, all these alerts, so it's it's very favorable uh, to to outsource it towards uh, uh, the service team. What we also see is the acceptance of the predictive software, and that it's kind of the discussion. Okay, uh, there's software in place, but uh, is, is it really working? Yeah, we need to see out. It's it's like. And sometimes you react like sending the junior engineer out in, in the plant uh, at the first day and saying, okay, what do you, do you see is wrong? So it takes some time for the people to accept that predictive software, the predictive uh, maintenance software works and delivers the right outputs. What we also experience as a barrier is the business case thinking, which in that sense is uh, uh, and looking back at existing problems and finding uh, solutions for an uh, for these existing problems where predictive maintenance and predictive software is more like, okay, we prevent problems from occurring. So how do you deal with that? And what we also see uh, a lot of times is a focus on getting more, more and more data. So um, and people don't want to be sure 90%, but hey, you get more data, uh, 90, 95%, more data, more data, and postponing the discussion to implement this predictive uh, maintenance way of working. And that's where, for example, also uh, using it as a service could very much help you because you have a project, you have a plan, and you have people in place that are experienced with the situation and can help you further. So that's why we've uh, put in place, and Dafina has uh, already uh, turned on the camera. Just one, one second, uh, Dafina. So that's why we uh, put in place our uh, analytical monitoring service. And uh, we have uh, a global network of uh, experts, process engineers. And what is important in process engineers is that they both understand the value of the alerts, so they can value the alerts, but they also understand the processes and the combination and uh, the way of working. 
to combine it and to have the, the discussions. And it, it's, it's not that it costs a lot of time for clients, or I think uh, half an hour per week is, is the maximum, for example, that there's discussion on the value of alerts and understanding the processes. That's very important. And also, and we know about uh, uh, the, 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 the digital transformation, the, the barriers it has, et cetera, to bring this further. So air conditions, I think uh, I want to mention this uh, before I hand over to Divina to, to share her experiences uh, for, for a good start on predictive mode, uh, maintenance with uh, software is that you have good organizational alignment. This means you have to be clear on the goals. You have to be clear on the responsibilities, uh, given the fact that actually there is no responsibility for preventing uh, uh, in operations, uh, upcoming failures, and a way of working, who does what, etc. That's that's very important. What's also very important, and because it's a new thing, you, you come into discussions, is this in-depth understanding of the processes and the alerts. And the FINA, for example, sometimes has to, to convince the people, okay, but this is really serious what we see here. So the, uh, the, the service has to bring uh, the value to the alert. You need to understand the digital transformation, of course, and you need to have a clear approach to overcome resistance and barriers. And that's what we all gathered in this analytical monitoring service and to bring our clients further in uh, their digital transformation process. Uh, Davina, I'd like to hand over to you, uh, you. to show with us uh, some examples and experiences that you have as a process engineer uh, working in our analytical monitoring center um, and share this uh, experiences uh, with uh, with us. Yeah? Yes. Next Tell slide, me. please, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And then thank you, everyone, for being here today. And as Robert explained so far, so as a part of PDM as service, Process engineers like me are working in analytical monitoring center, offering our analytical monitoring services. And I would like to share my experience as being a part of this. And of course, we know there are various challenges. So before we talk about experiences, we need to also understand what is the challenge behind it really. And I'm sure most of you or can relate to these challenges on your day-to-day -day life, um, working in a production plant. Next slide, please, Robert. I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And yeah. um, I think it's better maybe I take it, hand it over. I, maybe I can share my screen and it should be better. What do you think? Uh, let's continue and see. Uh, so just, just say next. Okay. Thank you. So let's talk about the challenges. So there are various challenges. So the first one is, um, for example, acceptance of a new software. So a software can be scary and people think, oh, what do I do with it? How do I learn it? There will be a lot of complications with it. And this is kind of a problem in the process engineer, a process industry right now, because there is a really less acceptance of new digitalization software because people are a bit uh, not so comfortable using it. And therefore comes the next point, because because of this, it's not just the acceptance, also the other hand, we have time limitation because in the production team, they are so busy and they're constantly chasing behind fire and they have a lot of tasks to do on the day-to-day -day operation. So they don't have enough time to deal with the new software and also see what it is going to offer them. And then because of that time limitation and this acceptance uh, issue, there is also this postponing actions because you know there is something going on and the software is telling you something and then you know your plan better and you think, why do I have to look at the software and I have so many tasks in my list, which is on my priority right now. And this is not an issue because this is developing. So as Robert explained previously, we always think, okay, there's something is wrong. Okay, there is a bad sensor now and it's not working anymore and I have to replace it. So that's in my task list. If there is something wrong with the sensor, there are some deviations. And I think that if the process is working fine, why should I take care of it? So there is this postponing action, which is common. And then the other thing is the building of trust and accountability. So this comes from a software. So for example, you have a person who is talking to you and telling you about an issue. 
and then rather than it's much it has much higher value than a software showing you something and telling you there's something wrong there and then how well are we right now developed or open minded to trust a software and then follow up on the alerts or issues the software is showing us. So these are the challenges we are facing right now. But then of course, with every challenges you have to overcome, you have to learn something, right? So now we have experiences from these challenges. So that's it. Then we have our AMS and then AMS. So process engineer like me are with you together during the complete span of trying out the software. So then we are there to motivate you to use this new solution. The motivation means we are also there for you in case of questions regarding the software, helping you, what are the issues with the software, how to operate it, how to deal with it, and we are there. So this gives more motivation to the plant team to try a predictive analytics software. And the next point is we have time limitation as a challenge on the other hand, and we are here as a part of AMS to reduce this uh, stress on you because we are taking over and we do part of the analysis and we will timely analysis the alerts and then give you weekly feedback. So you don't have to think about, oh, I have to log into the software and check what is the new alert there because we are there and we will take care of it and then we will have weekly discussions. So for example, I have multiple customers which I'm dealing with right now and we have weekly 30 minutes feedback meeting. So all they have to do is have a weekly meeting, 30 minutes, and then we provide you the upcoming issues with SAMGAR. And the next point is then we also do the follow-up because you know if a software is giving you something and then how accountable are you to a software? But then if you have another person, for example, a process engineer working with you, and I would ask you, okay, what happened? There was a temperature increase in the reactor, which we noticed it's slowly increasing. Did, did you send somebody to the site and check? Was there a maintenance report made? So there is a follow-up happening. So there is also an action to every event that is created in SAMGAR. And then we are coming to the last point, that is um, there is a EC, Robert? Yeah. Yeah. You send. <laughs> <laughs> we have a problem. So, um, so then we have a follow up. And then if you think of. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Let's... Oh, this is. Uh, okay. That's our, our safety. Work around here. I know it takes about five seconds from now to continue. Are you take over the FINA? The FINA, you're muted. Can you see my screen now? I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. So now we talked about three points and experiences. So you have motivation, you have somebody follow up, following up on the event and they are analyzing it on time and then giving you feedback. And therefore you have an easy transaction to digital tool. Now you are comfortable with the software, you're comfortable with the event it is giving you and you are motivated towards uh, the alerts that is generated by the software. So this is the experiences we have learned so far working with AMS. Um, and the next slide is I would like to show some of the use cases of SAMGARD regarding um, the alerts which was generated in SAMGARD and how we offered this as a part of our service to get to our customers and what were the action taken and what happened afterwards. Yeah. So the next slide is I have a compressor failure here for you. And then SAMGARD normally provides you an alert which multiple tags which is relevant to an event or an upcoming issue in a production plan. So here you see I have the two tags on the top, the purple one and the brown one is the vibration measurement and then the green one is the temperature measurement of a compressor. And we had um, this plant, in this plant we had an alert on the vibration measurement, there was an increase and it was alerted by SAMGARD on the 22nd. Yeah, so as soon as it was alerted and then we communicated it. So me as a part of the AMS team communicated it to the production team and then they were okay. They said, okay, that's not normal. See, because you have 
previously rather a stable um, graph and then there was a sudden increase and then they send somebody to the site because from part of us since i'm there then i check this alert and then analyze it on time and then forward it to the plan team and then they make an internal report to send somebody to the site and check what's wrong with the compressor so this is what happened and they sent somebody to the site and on the initial analysis on site they couldn't find a reason why there was an increase in the vibration but then of course although we could not find anything on the site it was still concerning for us okay why it's happening and what can we do so the next step was the production team thought okay now we need to get our redundant compressor online because the main compressor can fail any time but then at this time exactly the redundant compressor the second one was also undergoing some smaller smaller repairs so what they did was they fixed the second compressor as soon as they possible and they they kept in line being ready for an expected failure on the main compressor and then that's what happened so the compressor worked for some time and then it failed again on 11th two but what it, although the compressor failed what was the value given by samgard samgard gave a much much earlier alert that gave enough time from the plan team to plan their prepare or prepare for an expected failure and then have a second compressor in ready so they were not uh, surprised by this failure they had enough time to plan for it so this reduces the time uh, that they are not chasing behind the fire and less stress on the plan team and um, the whole process was uh, much 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 easier so of course from this alert and also offering a service um, of these analysis we learned so many things we learned that there is a time limitation of the plan staff so for example if the um, event analysis was done by them probably they were busy and nobody checked the software and they even could have overlooked yeah and nobody checked it and they did not have enough time to repair the second compressor to get in ready for an expected failure and then because of this event there was also trust built because they see the real value which we can offer and this cost us they were monitoring another plan by themselves and they thought okay now this ams has worked out really well and we need to try the ams also for our second plan and then we expanded to an, another plan and also because i'm there and i'm asking them okay there is an increase in vibration what happened and then there's a follow up so that nobody is like taking it lightly and the next steps are taken and there is also a less stress on the plan team they don't have to try the they don't have to themselves use the software because we are there to analyze and then give them reports so this was the first thing we learned and then i would like to show another use case so you can compare how two different scenarios can occur in a process plan so the next one is a column failure so i have here the differential pressure see both are the same measurements it's just um, two different data points so there was a differential pressure increase um, in a column it was a packed column and then this the, the increase was rather steady so you see it was increased from almost from 30 millibar to 40 over a period of time and then with this plan team, I have weekly meetings. So, so if there's an event, unless it's, up, of course, it's very critical, I write them an email right away or the call them up, call them and talk to them that I see something um, developing in this area of the plan. But this, I come, we had our weekly meeting and then we discussed together. And obviously you can see that there is a steady increase. And then this, then they took an action right away they thought okay there is increase and something is going on and then they checked and then the packing um was completely there was fouling in the packing and the packing and this caused a flooding in the column and which have to be replaced so this alert helped them to prevent a major distillation column failure and also they had enough time to plan for repairs because it was not too late till the pressure was too high and then they were they had a complete failure they had enough time because it was a developing issue and they were able to go and fix it on site and um, so what happened after this event with this customer was there was a cultural barrier like a mindset change because with this exactly with this customer i would like to share another interesting example so when we started after a um, few days of operation there was a new alert by samgard it was related to a steam wall failure and then there was some strange fluctuation in the pv values of the control wall and the process team saw this event and they said 
I can see that the valve is working again. There is nothing wrong with the OP. Um, the valve is sending in, sending in steam continuously and I, we don't think it's an issue. So they completely ignored the issue because for them it was normal and they were not concerned about it. But then the valve worked and worked and it failed after two months, yeah. So then exactly after that, there was also a cultural mindset change because now you, you, you are not chasing fire. You are not till the end and then thinking, okay, what can I do? This is going to fail. And there's a change of mindset. They think, okay, I can detect the problem earlier. If I detect earlier, I have much better time to, to react to the problem and stop the problem, yeah? And also this even timing, the much earlier, pre earlier alert helped the plant team to carefully plan for the replacement. And then of course, this was monitored by us. And uh, since we were looking at it, uh, probably if the plant team was looking at it, they probably would have seen it much late and there was nobody checking the events. And then this event could have been totally overlooked and developed in a failure. And also there is a trust on the software and there is a trust um, also on us as a part of service uh, providers um, that we provide timely alerts and analysis of the events. So um, that's it. And now I think we are on the Third poll question, uh, I would give it back to Robert. Yeah, Davina, could you please uh, uh, take care of the slides, the last slides? Uh, so, uh, yeah, sure, sure. I won't, I won't mess up here. Yeah. So, um, we were wondering uh, uh, what do you consider to be the major barrier for implementation of predictive maintenance? And it could be either technology, uh, mainly technology, mainly organizational, and organizational. And um, yeah, please vote. I cannot see any answers, uh, unfortunately, now. Perhaps, Divina, you could share the, the outcome. Do you see it? Yes, I can see it. Let's give them a couple of minutes to answer. Yeah, a couple of seconds. Uh, ten, <laughs> tens of seconds <laughs> will be fine. Yeah, no problem. I'm just curious how people look at it also. Ah. Well, this was the result we were hoping for. Eh? <laughs> no, I, it, it's clear eh, that uh, only the technology is not a problem. And uh, a, a third uh, of, of our viewers uh, say, okay, it's mainly technology and two thirds, it's, uh, it's mainly organizational for organizational. And that's exactly the reason why we, um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, well, we have developed this uh, predictive maintenance as a service, service uh, to help uh, our clients uh, forward in, in the process also because we've now we've experienced that it is not only the technology. And uh, we see that the technology can provide uh, uh, this alert. It, it's there, it's, it, it's quite simple. You can directly handle it, but the complexity behind uh, uh, states that we need to to bring it as a service so thank you for for answering that and uh, Divina, could you share the last slide so to summarize yeah, yeah just go through is no problem and we have the online data yeah, so your historian and uh, um, we continuously streaming and we have the algorithms the AI and machine learning algorithms in place they're actually tirelessly looking 24 seven in these deviations in your data in your system and looking for equipment and process problems. And when there's a relevant one, it's reported to the analytical monitoring engineer like Davina, for example, or one of her colleagues. And she is in contact, in close contact with the plan team to discuss uh, the alert, to, to explain the alert, to understand the process and to discuss the proper actions. And from that, there is feedback, so the team operates as one, and where the proper action is taken, and the event is closed and documented. And the software all supports uh, the, the administration of, uh, of these types of, uh, of uh, actions. So that was it for now. Uh, the last slide is, thank you for, for listening. And uh, we have uh, a few minutes left for the, for the questions and answers. I don't know, Becky, do you have, uh, hello, there you are. 
Yes, we have had some questions come through, which is great. Um, so we'll have a couple of minutes now to, to answer those. Um, someone has asked, when a new kind of failure failure comes and gets reported by the software, how are the technicians able to understand the cause for the alert and the consequences it might have if they don't fix it? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, what you see here and what I think also is uh, explained by Divina, uh, we, from, from the uh, service center, we were able with the software to analyze also the problem. And what uh, uh, Divina, for example, showed are a few uh, uh, tags, uh, a few values, but uh, the system also uh, proposes extra tags, take a further look. So you can build this case and discuss it with uh, the um, with the, with the plan team where to go and what to do. So that's that's a discussion. And what you sometimes see, uh, it, it, it's it's more differently. Yeah, sometimes uh, you see that it's it's in a very critical place, yeah? like uh, the distillation column, for example. And then that's that's the moment where you take uh, a direct action. And we see sometimes that it's 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 not in a quite uh, uh, critical place. Uh, so uh, it was decided to leave it a bit. And that, that's up to the engineer in our service center and the plan team uh, to decide upon uh, the, proper, uh, the proper actions. Perfect, great. And then the next question that I have is, what are the best possible FN and FP rates you can get through the software? The FN and the FP, uh, let me check out uh, the questions. I don't see this question and I don't, the FN and the FP rates. If not, I can I can move on to a different question. Yeah, can't please. See that one. On yes, no problem. Um, next question is, are you able to isolate and identify the fault severity through the software? The fault severity. Yeah, well, actually the fault severity uh, is uh, what it does, the software does, it recognizes the upcoming failure. So it, it shows out where the failure is. And um, it does not calculate. What 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 we can do in system is estimate uh, uh, the, 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 the prevented failure. But of course, uh, it's depending on uh, when you would act in a later stage. But you always look at, OK, how important is it? What are the effects? And it determines uh, the actions uh, you take. And uh, in the end, you can say, okay, we've prevented this amount of, uh, uh, of failure or that's, uh, that, that, that's what we see, for example, in um, uh, uh, explanation to the management. Uh, so what are the failures? What were the expected or the saved costs? So that the software can show out uh, uh, the costs that are saved by uh, acting on these uh, failures. Perfect, great. And then the next question that I have for the two of you is how can we manage poor or bad data with the technology? Yeah, yeah good question. So um, and the data is available. The data is available, the model, the model is available. And uh, what you see is that um, how we built this uh, filter, this, this digital twin, that's actually filtering the relevant and the non-relevant uh, uh, alerts. And in the beginning, in the first month of a pilot, for example, there's some interaction uh, to get it working uh, uh, properly. So you, you need to refine it uh, uh, a bit to get the proper uh, alerts. And of course, uh, then you discuss also with uh, from the engineer with the plan team, what do we see and um, how do we act upon it? I saw also a question there um, of uh, hey, will the AI be able to differentiate if the sensors are paradoxically under calibration or under control. So what we can do, for example, and if we know, uh, we can see, for example, that a sensor is taking out or uh, uh, there, there's an action taken towards the assets. And we get, uh, we get a message that in that part, there's some kind of action. And for example, what we do there is um, we can uh, uh, switch off that part, that small part of uh, of the of the system, so we don't get any false alerts. So depending on where, for example, uh, the action, we can switch off the the, the system. Great. 
great. Um, the next question is, how long does it take for the creation of the model and how long does it take to set up? Um, and then another one is that follows on is, how many extra sensors do I need to install as well? Yeah, okay, in general, uh, for, for normal uh, uh, company, the, um, the setup time is one to two weeks. Huh? So you have your IT preparations, but for us to make the modeling, and to have the workshop, it takes about one to two weeks, and then the system is up and and, uh, and running. And your other question was, oh, the amount of extra sensors, yeah? Yes, yes, it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, well, actually, uh, what I uh, what I shared with the people is that we used uh, the data already available in the historian, so. Uh, we don't need extra sensors. We don't need investment in extra sensors. We use the data already available. Um, I'd like to get back to your FN and FP, uh, Becky. Uh, false positive and false negative. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so what are the best possible false positive and false ne negative rates you can get through the software? Actually, um, we, we, we're not talking about false positives or false negatives. Uh, and and um, because uh, the software is not absolute, right? it's not absolute software. So we don't right. strive to 100% uh, clear. We strive to make it work. And this means uh, that you have the software, it, it, it detects deviation. Deviation is there. It's true, there, there is deviation. But the effect or the understanding of the deviation, that's what where the analytical monitoring services are also in. So uh, and we do not measure uh, actually false positives or uh, uh, false, false negatives in that sense. And we use the alerts that are provided and combine it with the actual operations and knowledge in the plan and to take the proper action. Perfect, great. And then the final question, because we're coming close to the end of the, of the webinar now, is how about data protection? How, Sam, how does SamGuard work with that? Yeah, um, so that could, could be either, uh, I think the advantage of SamGuard is that um, uh, we can use it, for example, on-premise. So uh, the only thing we would need there, if it's on-premise, uh, is a, a VPN connection to uh, the mirrored uh, uh, historian in uh, the IT environment, as we call it, and uh, that, that's, that's totally secure. So uh, to avoid a uh, long and, and, and complex discussion about sharing data in the cloud or whatever, and we are able to do it uh, on premise. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and that is all the time we have for today. Thank you to everyone that has joined. Uh, we hope that you found that webinar insightful. If you would like to rewatch the webinar, you will be sent the recording and slides within 24 hours. Uh, also, thank you to our amazing speakers, Robert and Dafina. Uh, if we didn't get time to answer your questions, the team will be in touch to answer them. Have a good evening. Keep an eye out for Reuters events future content that you can also sign up to. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.